It's sunny somewhere in the world, just not in Toronto today. <laughs> but the, the average person watching this online is sitting somewhere where the sun is beaming down on them. It's an incredibly abundant and clean resource. Another way to look at its, at its abundance is to say that if we were to cover a quarter of the area of the state of Nevada with reasonably efficient solar cells, the kind that we can make today, then that would be sufficient to power the Earth's energy needs for uh, overall time in the steady state. So the sun is, is clean, it's abundant, and most importantly, it's free. So why on Earth are we relying on these legacy fossil fuels to the extent that we are? Well, the answer actually does come down to cost, not the cost of the sun's free energy. It comes down to the cost of the uh, uh, harvesting technologies that we have at our disposal today. Let me illustrate how important the cost of the technologies is. If we don't do anything different from what we're doing now, if we just extrapolate the rate at which solar cell technologies are getting a little bit cheaper every year, just incrementally cheaper, then on the left is the case for 2030, for the year 2030. By that time, it will make purely rationally economic sense to put solar panels at a kind of modest level. We won't have revolutionized or transformed the way in which we harness energy. And that's, that's 20 years out. On the right is the case if we have a breakthrough in the cost of harvesting solar energy. It's, it's all about the technology. It's not about a basic physical limit. It's not that we can't do this. It's that we have to work hard and invest and work as teams in order to solve this practical problem. So that's what my group at the University of Toronto does. We're trying to rethink, redesign, reimagine the solar cell. Today, the solar cell is made out often of silicon, a beautiful semiconductor material. It's the semiconductor material that's revolutionized information technology. It's transformed our lives. But it's an approach that relies on perfection, on purity, on heating the silicon to 1,000 degrees Celsius, on making a perfect crystal, a crystal that's kind of thick, a crystal that's rigid. And you can translate that rigidity and that thickness and that cost and, and that thermal budget uh, into a financial cost, not just the cost of the cell, but the cost of installing the cell as well. And so our view is that we could, we could transform, we could revolutionize this field if we could print solar cells the way we print newspapers. If we could make a semiconductor ink that we could print onto a flexible backing like the one shown here. And then not only would we have made a very manufacturable approach to making solar cells, it would be like printing newspapers, we would also uh, have the ability to deploy them so much more easily. We'd have these lightweight carpets that we'd roll out on a rooftop. So it's a really exciting challenge. It's a really important possibility. Uh, here's a picture of some of the semiconductor inks that we make. This is on the small scale. We're just dropping a droplet of this dark stuff. It absorbs all of the, all of the light. And uh, we actually just rotate this little transparent substrate, the droplet of ink spreads out, covers the substrate very uniformly, which it needs to do. Here's one of the finished cells. This is just a square inch kind of uh, illustration, so it's a small prototype, a bunch of different electrical contacts. That's, that's part of the game here, as well as absorbing the sun's energy, as well as turning it into electrons that can flow in the form of current. We need to extract that current, so we need to put these electrodes on one side uh, that are opaque and transparent on the other side. Now, the inks that we work with are, are called quantum dots, or nanocrystals. Here's a real super close-up picture of them. This is actually taken using a transmission electron microscope. So these are configured on the scale of a few nanometers, a few billionths of a meter. They're incredibly small, and their smallness, combined with these little molecule-based wrappers that we wrap around them, allow us to make what's called a colloid, uh, which is like paint. Uh, in a solvent, you can disperse the solid material if it's small enough, and if it's wrapped up in something that will cause it to want to stay in solution. So that paint that you saw on the previous page, it worked. It was a dispersion uh, because of the way we engineer the surface at the scale of the nanometer, at the scale of molecules and atoms. Now, there's another aspect to the way these solar cells work that's got me really excited, and that's the fact that as well as making them sprayable or paintable, we have also make them uh, tunable. So, you know, the sun, obviously, 
is a rainbow of colors, as we can see when the rainbows come out. Hopefully one will today. And we mirror that rainbow in our materials. We make a mirror of colors, uh, a, a rainbow of colors, uh, across the visible spectrum, but also in the infrared. Uh, we're able to engineer our materials such that they're very strong absorbers of the half of the sun's power that resides in the infrared wavelengths, as well as in the visible. And just recently, we figured out how to shrink the wrappers that wrap the semiconductor particles up and protect them smaller and smaller. So they're now just an atom thick. And so these particles can be, be rendered really closely packed together, really tightly knit. We've kind of made a, a nano cement in which these particles are made into a solid material once they dry. That's very, very dense and very, very well protected. So what is this all leading to? Where, what could it mean? If we can make, if we can fully realize the potential of this amazing resource, which is so vast, so abundant, and where the resource itself, the fuel, you know, the sun's power is free to us, if we can harvest it in this cost-effective way, uh, what could it mean? Where could it go? Well, of course, we'll start with uh, the roofs of homes and, and uh, the roofs of factories in Mississauga and in Shenzhen and around the world. Um, but why, why stop there? I and mean, once we have this flexible light capturing material, why not on our backpacks or on our tablet PCs? Why not the sail of a sailboat? Uh, why not integrate it into the materials that make up your electric vehicle? Why not conform these, cell, these, these light harvesting, energy harvesting materials into your EV? And that's just in this geography. Let's think globally. Uh, what about making one of these materials so cost effective that we could use it during the day to charge the battery uh, of a home, perhaps somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa? And then in the evening, use that energy, play it back to power a light bulb so that somebody can read or study in the evening, or to power a laptop. The implications of the democratization of energy through low-cost solar technologies are tremendous, they're global, and they're human. Thank you. <laughs>